Millennials. <laughs> Can't live with them. Let's get right to it. Uh, you received the C-Link, and it probably, you looked at it and thought, oh, great, about money. And if you are worried about that, uh, and you think that church only talks about money, maybe you think, man, it's been a long time since I've been to that church. Last time I was there, they talked about money. We would like to say welcome back, because that means you haven't been here since May. And uh, if you're talking about a series, it's been two years, and so we're glad to have you back. We believe that this is important. We want to kind of dive straight in. Today's message is a little bit different than our other messages. Usually we take a passage of Scripture, sometimes walking through a book, uh, maybe a narrative, and then we break it down verse by verse over time. Uh, but that's not necessarily what we're going to do today. Today is actually uh, the introduction to a three-part sermon. You might think of it as a three-part series, but in reality, this is really one big sermon, and uh, that's important because it will seem a little bit different. We just thought that preaching a two-hour sermon uh, would be a little too much for anybody. So we'll be out of here uh, about 35 minutes from now. And so we're going to kind of get straight to it in this new series. We're excited about it, but we're nervous about it. I mean, John chapter 6 recounts this story uh, where Jesus is preaching, and all the crowd is gathered around him, and many of them are disciples. And the Bible says that what Jesus said on that particular day was so offensive to the crowd that he lost them, that many left him at that particular moment. And these were disciples. I mean, these weren't just random casual followers. I mean, this was a moment in John chapter 6 where Jesus kind of thinned the herd, if you will. We're a bit scared that this series could be our John chapter 6 moment, but we'll just hang with it because we believe that it's so important that we're willing to take the risk. Now, there's reasons why that this message and this particular topic is so offensive. Uh, first of all is we're going to teach you how to do something that you think you already know how to do. And that always creates pushback, doesn't it? We're going to teach you to do something that you think you already know how to do. And actually, we're not even really trying to get you to do anything. At the end of this day, we're trying to get you to focus on what you can be. And we want you to be this, not do this. Statistically, we know that most Americans, average Americans, do not actually live this way. This does not characterize the average American. Now, I know that in this room and in this church, we have a lot of people that aren't average. But in this particular area, I'm concerned that many of us actually are. And so it's certainly difficult uh, because that you want to think that you know how to do it, but secondly, it's also about money. And we all know that how difficult it is to talk about money uh, because as soon as you do, people think that they're being sold. And I want you to hear me say today, we're not trying to sell you on anything. We're not trying to get you to do anything uh, at all. We just want to share something with you. We want to teach you something. But you recognize that no matter wh what it is or when you talk about money, there's always a sense of tension. You're always asking yourself the question is, you know, what is the ulterior motive here? Even when you're talking to your spouse. I suspect that even in your home, that some of the most difficult, stressful moments uh, between you and your spouse or you and your children involves money, doesn't it? And when you get stressed financially, you find that kind of carrying over into all the other areas of your life. And so when we talk about money, we recognize that your priorities and your selfishness are easily exposed. And we want you to know that if you've got it, you, 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 think, that, you think that you want more of it. And if you don't have it, you're tempted to compromise in order to get more of it. And, and there you are. But today we want to spend some time talking about it because we think it is so very important, even though many of us don't know how to do it because we weren't taught it. And if you were taught it, it would be so, so much of a blessing to you. I can speak with great authority on this, that this is a blessing to have been taught this. I grew up this way. We're going to try to teach you how to be generous. We're not going to try to teach you how to give. Everybody in this room actually knows how to give, but we want to teach you how to be generous. Now, most of you in this room are thinking to yourself exactly what we always think. When somebody says they're going to show you how to do something, you always come up with the exception of how you've done it a few times in the past. So like, for instance, hypothetically, in my home, my wife might say something like this. You never do enough work around the house. And I say, no, no, back in 2014, I emptied out the dishwasher all by myself, sweetie. Right? I come up with the exception. She says, you got to help me put the kids to bed. I'm like, no, hon. I mean, I mean, I, I mean I, you know, one of the kids is walking through the room, and, and, and I'm sitting down in the big chair there, and I'm reading through an article or something, and they've been already put to bed, and they come up, and they say, where's mom? And I say, she's back uh, in, in the bathroom brushing her teeth or something like that, and she gets them and puts them back in the room, and she says, 
why did you send them to me? And I said, because they wanted you. I mean, you know, why didn't you help them? I'm like, I don't know. They wanted you. I mean, back in high school, you wanted to be popular. Now you're the most popular person in the house. I mean, it, I mean, right? I mean, you worked for it. You got it, you know? And uh, mom, 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 she's the most popular with our dog even, which is really awesome. Uh, to think about, uh, but but you know, uh, and 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 but I mean, you know, she comes up with the idea that you know you got to help me tuck the kids in. I'm like, hey, like a week ago, a couple weeks ago, you were like, I mean, you know, oh, maybe months ago, uh, you went out on that work thing and you had the CPR class, and I put all the kids to bed by myself. I mean, that's the exception, right? And she's like, I'm like, she's like, well, well I do that every night. And I say, yeah, but it's hard. I mean, there's five of them, <laughs> and I know you're like judging me. You're like, you're like thinking, well, David, that shouldn't be so hard, and whatever. And you're like, it's your fault that you have five kids. I said, no, it's not my fault. My wife just couldn't keep her hands off of me, and uh, <laughs> you can't say that, can you? I don't know. Uh, that's another way to thin the herd. There's a couple of ways. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm gonna get a meeting with the elders. Uh, all right, uh, so, so here we got it. Uh, but, but, but you think about it, we always kind of come up with the exception. And so when we talk about generosity, it's easy to point out a particular moment in which you gave, in which there was some kind of fundraiser or an offering plate or somebody needed to have lunch bought for them and you bought it for the entire office or you gave a nice gift to someone who didn't even necessarily deserve it. And you, came up, you can come up with exceptions to kind of prove that you're generous, but in reality, we're not talking about a moment in time. We're not talking about little things here and there. We're talking about a person who actually has determined. Not, I mean, we're not talking about like a sales pitch. And there's nothing wrong with these random acts of kindness. I mean, I, I love random acts of kindness. We're all behind those. I love it when you're prompted to do something and you do it. You're motivated, even if you get sold on it a little bit. That's fantastic. But that is not what we're talking about. Because we're not going to teach you how to do that. You already know how to do that. Every American pretty much knows how to give. We're talking about generosity. I mean, generous people don't need a big inspirational pitch about some need in the world or the local community. They aren't moved by guilt because a generous person has actually moved beyond all of that. And I can sense when we kind of talk about this that there's like this sense of nervousness even in a room like this, but I want to make you a promise. And here's the promise, that we want something for you. We don't want you to do anything. We don't even pass offering plates here. We're not going to pass them during this service. we got offering buckets back there. Some people give online. Uh, we're grateful for all the people that are generous and do give on a regular basis. We're grateful for all of that. But we're not asking you to do that today. I mean, unless it's part of your generosity, we're not asking you to leave here and go, you know what, I mean, I was going to give 20 bucks, I'm going to give 40. I'm not trying to talk you into that today. If you hear me saying that, I want you to understand we're talking about rearranging your entire worldview around generosity. And this is so very important. We're going to kind of break it down for you and share with you how this actually look, looks. And I know that if you will listen, here's what I do believe, and I'm going to kind of put this up there. This is kind of the promise for what we believe will happen. If you prioritize generosity in your life, you will become a generous person. You will give more, save more, and consume less. You will give more, you will save more, and you will consume less. Now, there's a small subset of people in this room that actually you won't save anymore because you've saved all the money that you actually need, all right? You've got more, you've got more than enough. You've got more, you take the three people in the row in front of you, three people in the row behind you, and you actually have more than all of those people combined. So you may not save more, but you will give more and you will consume less. And let me tell you why that's important to you, because even though you've got a big savings account, you still feel stressed out about money. How crazy is that? And so we know that it's not a solution to our problems, but we keep thinking that if we get to the next level, that it will ultimately take away all of our issues. And if you don't like my promise, then I want you to take the promise that Jesus is going to make a little bit later when he says you will actually be happier. We will define this when we get to our text in just a moment. But you will actually be happier if you give. And I'll take it one step further, and here's what's great. If you are here today, and you may have already screwed up your finances, you have ruined all chances of you actually being generous. But listen, if you've got a middle schooler or a, or a 10th grader, 11th grader, 12th grader, college student, just getting out of college, getting their graduate degree, I don't know where they are. If you will get them here and allow me and allow us for the next couple of weeks to teach them about generosity, here's our promise to you. They will give more, save more, and consume less. And when you are old and don't have any money, they will take care of you, okay? They will be ready. We will equip them. We're going to do this for you, for your kids, even if it's not for you. We're just about teaching you something. We're giving you something here. We're not asking for anything. So I want you to think about it for a second, and I'm just going to kind of put this out there. Uh, if you, uh, I mean, it's, it, it's really crazy. Generosity has to be taught. It's not actually natural. I mean, do your kids just be, wait, you know, come out of the womb sharing, wanting to share? Is that, is that how they come out? Or do you have to teach them to share? 
What do you have to do? I mean, you have to teach them to share, don't you? And, and actually, being taught to share is very important. And, and as a matter of fact, it's part of our Americana, actually, in the Western world where we actually live. We're kind of conflicted, aren't we? Because in one sense, in one sense we're kind of thinking to ourselves, you know what? Most of us do want to be generous. Most of us do like giving. Most of us do want to think. I would present to you, and I don't have time to kind of make the case right here, but I would present to you that this is kind of the Christian ethos that actually is kind of, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, permeates the entire West, the Western Europe as well as here, and we kind of have this idea that generosity is very, very helpful, but yet at the same time, we find ourselves kind of tugged back towards what's actually natural, which isn't generosity, it's actually selfishness, and I would go a step further and say what is, nat- what is natural is actually crazy. When it comes to money, I'm going to tell you, what most people actually believe is crazy. And, and, and I want you to think about it for just a second. We pay interest on depreciating items. Now, let me say that again, because most of you don't understand this. We spend more money than we make. The average American lives, depending on what study you look at, on between 107 and 122% of their income. That's kind of the idea. That's crazy. You're spending more money than you have. Let me put it on a chart just so you kind of get it. Okay, here's what it is. When you and I purchase something, whether it be a meal or some drinks or whether it be some furniture that we sit on or a television that we watch or a car that we drive, from the moment we buy it and begin to pay interest on it, the cost of that item begins to increase over time. Does this make sense? The value of that item actually begins to decline over time. That's crazy. I mean, I'm just saying. But now, you know, y'all are going, well, I mean, I mean, I mean we all just kind of live that way, right? <laughs> well, listen, only because you've been taught crazy, you've followed what's natural. We are told this is the way that we are supposed to live, but is it really the way that we are supposed to live? What if there was a different way? And I'm just going to say it, and don't throw things at me. Listen. We don't feel rich, but we are. And we feel generous, but we aren't. Let me just say that again. We don't feel rich, but we are. And we feel generous, but we aren't. Now, I recognize that at this point in the sermon, um, you may be offended, but at least you're not bored. (laughs) I'm just telling you, I know you don't feel rich, and I get that. I don't feel rich. We had Stephen Aputara in for... uh, for our 10th anniversary, the guy who directs all of our, uh, he lives in northern Ghana, they're in Africa, and he directs all of our ministries uh, over there, all the churches that we're planning. I think we're close to 30. When we go there in January, we're probably going to get top that 30 number of churches that seminary students, that the generous gifts of people from this church, actually, we're the only church doing this for them, and sending people over there, educating their pastors. And he came into town, and, uh, and while he was there, he came to my house, and uh, he pulled out his digital camera that we had given him. It was actually an iPad, and he was using this iPad that we had given to him to prepare his sermons on. And uh, he was taking pictures, and he started taking pictures of my house. And uh, he took pictures of my pantry, and he took pictures of my walk-in closet, and he took pictures of our garage because it's a separate little house for our cars. And his favorite picture was he asked my daughter to get inside of her car because she's 17 years old, and of course we couldn't have a 17-year-old without an automobile. They, he lives in a town with 100,000 people, maybe 200,000 people, and there aren't 300 cars in the whole town. My do- he takes a picture of my daughter in her car. And I'm thinking, would you please stop doing that? You are making me feel Rich. And then I realize there's a whole lot more people like him in this world than there are like me. So I know that we don't feel very rich, but we are. And we don't feel generous. We feel generous, but we actually aren't. We can look at our ongoing, our planned, our strategic giving, and it does not reveal that we are rich people or that we are generous people. It actually reveals that we are very selfish because we're spending more than we actually make. And so we're going to take a look at what it means to be generous. And what we're going to do by looking at it, we've got to start with four myths in regards to this definition and then look at what something that Jesus said and then ask ourselves to use our imagination and then we're going to be done for the day at this first part of the sermon. The first thing, 
four myths. The first one is that generosity is spontaneous. The first idea is that generosity is spontaneous. That's not what we're talking about here. I hope that you do give to random acts of kindness. I hope that you are a giver. But I want you to recognize that today you may be a giver and not necessarily be a person who's generous. Generous people are less spontaneous in their giver giving. They're less driven by emotion and a good sales pitch, and they are more strategic. They are not hit and miss. They have kind of thought through this, the percentage, the priority. They've kind of looked at all of these things of how they're going to order all of their finances, and it is not just spontaneous. Is there some room in there for spontaneity? Absolutely. The Spirit constantly works, but a generous person is strategic. Secondly, the, first, the second myth is generosity is determined by cash flow. Generosity is determined by cash flow. In other words, when, if, if, you think, if you think I give when I have money, beginning of the month, and I don't give when I don't have money, end of the month, then you are a giver, but you are not generous. That's a myth about the definition of generosity. Third thing, it's the amount that counts. It's the amount that counts. Now, this is really kind of an interesting idea because we tend to believe, we say things like this, man, that guy, that was such a generous gift, right? As a matter of fact, if you were to come say, man, I love the Blake's Run idea. I'm going to come give this thing. I'm, I'm gonna, my, my company's going to sponsor it. I'm going to write a check out. I'm going to go find Randy Wade because he's kind of over that ministry, I believe, in you know, college students going out on mission trips. And boom, here's this check. It is possible that Randy responds to you by saying, man, what a generous gift. But truthfully, Randy has no idea whether or not that's a generous gift. It's not determined by how many zeros are behind it. You'd have to know everything about your financial situation, and even more than that, we'd have to know your heart. There's a great story in the Bible uh, that is in our focal passage today, but it's about this widow uh, that she's in the temple, and all the Pharisees are bringing their money. And in that particular time, money was coins, and they collected it in these big giant jars, and the Pharisees would come walking in, and it would sound like Vegas, man. And everybody would go, wow, listen to how long that was, you know. They were probably even strategic about how they poured it in to make sure that they got the longest, you know, kind of trickle, if you will. And, and here comes the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And then this woman comes in, and she's got two little bitty coins, not the, the big clangy coins. And he goes, ding, ding. She drops them both in. And Jesus looks at those around him, and he says, that woman right there just gave more than everybody else. What's Jesus commenting in that moment on? He's not commenting on the size of the gift. He's commenting on what? Her generosity. He can see her heart. So you don't want to make sure that you don't fall into the myth that you begin to believe that it's the amount that counts. Number four, the fourth myth, is being rich. It's easier for rich people to be generous. It's easier for rich people to be generous. Now, I want you to know that this is the one right here that many of us kind of go, ah, I get it. If I was wealthy, if I get to be wealthy, and you even have this ongoing conversation and dialogue with God, as if, God, listen, you bless me with a bunch of stuff, and when I get an, an ability to display my generosity, when I have a means to do so, then I will display my generosity. I got news for you. You're in your 20s here, and you think to yourself that one day you'll be generous once you've made it. First of all, you probably never will think you've made it. Second of all, when you do, you'll just be a greedy, wealthy person. You will not be generous at that particular point. You need to begin those patterns now. If you're a teenager, if you're a young person, if you're a college student, I'm telling you, right now, you get $100 a week. Uh, you get $100 a week, $100 a month. You put 10 in right now. I'm just telling you, go ahead and start it now. The pattern's easier now. It gets way more complex. I don't know how, but somehow or another, it gets way more complex when you're talking thousands. Just saying. So I want you to think about this for just a moment in regards to all of these myths. And I want to give you a definition of generosity that we're going to use throughout this entire series. And it's a bit of a clunky de definition. I'm going to put it up on the screen. I see a lot of you taking notes, and so you can write these down. And we're going to talk about this about kind of as the framework for which we're going to approach the Scripture, kind of pulling some things from the Scripture that are very clear. These are principles. They're thematic in nature. And we're going to pull these out over the next couple of weeks. And so let me give you the definition. It's a little bit clunky. You're not going to be easily memorized. You won't be easy to memorize it, but I want you to think through each thing. First of all, generosity is the premeditated. That means you have a plan, calculated. In other words, you know how much you're going to give, whether it be a dollar figure or percentage. Designated 
In other words, you've predecided where it's going to go, leaving room, of course, for other gifts. Emancipation, meaning that you've set it free. Generous people understand that in order to not be possessed by their possessions, they have to realize that they are not a possessor of those things to begin with. Your possessions can actually possess you. And many of us have been in that place before, and we're like, yeah, that is true. Emancipated, personal financial of, your, of the personal financial assets. In other words, we're not talking about being generous in this series. It's another sermon, your time or your skills. This is a series about being generous with your money. And when you free your money, when you emancipate it, you free yourself from your money, which allows you to recognize what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 when he says this. No, he says this, no one can serve two masters. And he is talking about God and money. It is impossible to serve, to be enslaved to your money, to at the same time be enslaved to the lordship of Christ. Now, I'm going to get to the text. I mean, I think it's about time, isn't it? It's found in Acts chapter 20, and I'm going to give you a lot of background. And remember, the core of what we're going to look at is next week. But this idea is going to set the stage for what we believe today is all about. Now, the Apostle Paul is leaving Ephesus. He's leaving them. He's letting them know that he may never see them again. He's gathered together all of the leaders, and they're begging him not to go. And there is this little narrative. He begins to rehearse for them. He begins to recount to them all of the things that he has actually done for them, much of which has actually been financial. That even though Paul had the means to make a great deal of money, he was a Roman citizen and a Jew. He had a great deal of education. He had been schooled, uh, he had been schooled in some of the finest schools. And so Paul had a great ability to make a great deal of money. But it appeared that all of the money that he made, he in turn basically blessed other people with it, that he was giving it back away. And that Paul was not asking for a gift. He was not trying to get rich. He was actually had squandered his life, and in leaving, he wants to make sure that this final little statement that he makes would have an impact. And so when he stands before them, he stands with great authority, and here's what he says in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Here's what he says. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he himself said. Now, these next little few words these next eight words are in red, if you have a red letter or Bible. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, how many people have ever either heard or said it's more blessed to give than receive? Raise your hand. How many people have done that? Raise your hand. That's almost all of us. We have heard this. You may have even said it, but you probably didn't know that, number one, it was said by Jesus, and number two, we know that it was said by Jesus because it's recorded by the Apostle Paul. He recounts it. Luke actually writes that particular thing down because he wrote the book of Acts. Now, here's what is interesting about this. He doesn't have to tell them that Jesus said it. All of those Ephesian elders know that Jesus said that, but he wants to remind them one more time that Paul says, I am following Jesus, and Jesus was the ultimate example. If there is one thing, and if there is one thing that is more valuable than our silver and our gold, it is the life of our, our life of our family and our own lives. And Jesus laid that down. His entire purpose was to squander his life so that you and I may actually receive it. This is called the gospel message. This is the example that is up there for us that Paul wants them to understand. It's more blessed to give than receive. And Paul's not about to take up a love offering. I mean, Paul's not asking them to give him anything. He's just pointing out the way that he lived his life. And here's what's crazy. Despite the fact that he had been through all kinds of persecutions, despite the fact that Paul had gone through all kinds of difficulties, he describes himself as blessed. And this word actually means in a state of, per, of, of, uh, a state of ongoing happiness. And Paul realizes that the reason he was blessed, the reason he was happy, and this is why you can be happy as well if you become a generous person, is because he squandered his life for the kingdom. He squandered his wealth for the, for the kingdom. And I think he would say the same thing to you and to me. And that statement is so familiar to them, and it may be so familiar to us, but we need to understand that it is not just an event. It's not that just Jesus did one thing for us. It was all for us. It was not that Paul did just one thing for a person. He had a whole life that was organized around serving others, around giving to other people. It wasn't a time, because if you're just talking about a specific time in regards to giving, then we know if we just kind of read this the wrong way, we don't recognize that he's talking about, you know, an ongoing worldview lifestyle where it's more blessed to give than receive. If we're not talking about that, then we get ourselves into a specific instance in which we give, and somebody walks up and goes, man, this is, you know, it's more blessed to give than receive. 
And you're thinking, yeah, but sometimes it'd be nice to receive a little something, something as well, right? I like to receive a little something occasionally. And, and, what's, and what's crazy about this, and, and what really kind of st- stands out to me, is that this lifestyle of happiness, it, this contented in spirit part of Paul, is, is an entire orientation, not a moment in time, not a random act of giving. Not, okay, I'll give, but no. Blessed is a lifestyle that's oriented around generosity. Now, at this point in the sermon, I recognize that some of you may be thinking, okay, how many weeks is this little series going on for? I mean, our family, we're kind of a 50-50 family, if you know what I mean. We're just going to kind of sit out the next two, if you will. We'll come for three in a row afterwards. It's right before Christmas anyway. Um, it'll be a little bit better. Listen, relax. All I can tell you about that, listen, just Relax. Just listen. I mean, this is an opportunity to be taught. If you Listen, if you don't like anything that we have to say, listen, I can't make you do anything. You don't do half the stuff I ask you to do anyway. <laughs> I mean, you walk out here like, hey, you know, that stuff he's in there, I ain't doing that. You know, I mean, I get that. So, you're, I mean, there's no danger here, right? If you want to even try just kind of orienting your life towards generosity, you can always go back to your crazy way of doing it. That's what you can do. It's all, it'll, be right, it'll be right there for the taking, I promise you. It doesn't matter who's president. You need to be crazy, crazy, right? I mean, look, if we wanted something from you as a church, and listen, I want to be clear. We're trying to teach you something. We've got this for you, and I can prove this to you because, listen, if we wanted something from you, we'd get someone up here with a microphone with a really great story, and we're not even going to have any like, music here at the end or whatever. We'd have someone playing perfect music, and then I would show you pictures of the kids you know, with their starving bellies in Africa, and then we'd, we'd, we, you know, the music would be playing just right, and, and then we'd give some big emotional appeal um, <clears throat> and, and, uh, and try to talk you into giving a gift. We could sell you on giving. I mean, that's what we try to do. I mean, there's some great salesmen out there that can actually say, as a matter of fact, some of you don't like giving anymore because every time that you give, it feels like you've actually been sold. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a life that is oriented. This is way better than that. You have permission to ignore me, but I think you owe it to yourself. You owe it to your children to help them understand how it is that they can be generous. So before you write me off, I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to, ask you to imagine just one thing. I'm going to ask you to, to, to do something that maybe you have not really ever considered doing. Just in a second, I want you to think about over the last 10 years of your life. Depending on how old you are, uh, if, if you're you know, in your 20s, 5 years, if you're in your 30s, 10 years, if you're in your 40s, 20 years, last 10, 20 years of your life, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to think of all the money you've wasted. Now, I'm going to let you define wasted as you want to. Maybe because you, know, the, you shouldn't have got into a lease, you should have gone ahead and purchased, and you had to make the big payment at the end, uh, whether it be you should have kept the car a little bit longer, or the house that you bought because you thought it was an investment, but it wasn't really an investment, or, or you know, some habit that you got into, uh, uh, some spending, you know, it's like a boat. Why did I buy a boat? Uh, you know, <laughs> well, that landed. Uh, but, but you, you know, I, I don't know what it is. I'm not trying to kind of speak into your thing. I'm saying whatever money it is that you've determined that over the last, tw- you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 years that you actually have wasted. I want you to think of all, you had all that money back. All of it. And it was put in an account. And whether it be, you know, $5,000, tens of thousands of dollars, for some it might even be hundreds of thousands of dollars when you really think about the amount of money that you've actually wasted. Lessons that you got for sports that your kids don't even play. Right? I mean, just think about it. I don't know what, the, what, what it is. I mean, just think about all that money is back in an account. $10,000, $20,000, $30,000. And here's the deal. And you are given some magical way. You are actually going to be allowed to manage this money, but you can never possess this money that you've got 12 months to give that money away. 12 straight months. You're just able to go, you know, day after day, after moment, you're able to give that money away. Over the course of 12 months. I mean, at, at, the, at, at the school, they're like, man, we got this family, and then, you know, mom has cancer with a couple of kids, and uh, she's got $500 left on her deductible. We're going to do a, you know, a bake sale and whatever, and you're able to walk in and go, no, 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 listen, here's not a $500. Here's, here's $1,000. Just cover it all and give her some extra to spend some time with her family. 
and they ask you for, there's, there's some kind of issue that's out there that people don't know how they're going to actually solve it. You're just blessing them, man. You're just dropping money left and right. You only got 12 months to do so. And they're like, golly, are you rich? And you're like, no, an angel of the Lord sat at the end of my bed and told me that in 12 months I had to give away $82,000. I mean, I don't know. What it, I mean, how crazy would that be? How awesome would that be? How enjoyable would that actually be to manage it even though you don't actually possess it? Let me ask you this. What if you did that moving forward? I mean, what if instead of buying all of the frivolous stuff and wasting all the frivolous opportunities, instead of doing that, what if? What if you decided going forward, I was going to take that, be intentional about it, strategically generous, and then cared for, gave to, blessed, other people. How different would my life feel? How blessed would my life actually be? Uh, You could be happier. Your kids would be better set, and you would understand financial things far better than you do today. And we're going to teach you that. And that's important. Let me tell you why. And I don't really know how to end this. I think you guys know that, uh, that I make it my priority to be honest and transparent with you guys. And there's a lot of times that I get up here and what I share with you is just theory and it's just philosophy. Uh, it's, it's, I, I mean, I believe it to be true because the scripture teaches it, but I'm still struggling with whatever, this particular area of righteousness, this kind of intimacy with God, uh, this part of my prayer life, whatever it is that's going on. And I try to tell you guys when I struggle with those things. Uh, when I struggle with shame and guilt, condemnation, feeling like uh, that I'm damaged goods, all, I, I try to be open and share those things with you. I struggle in a lot of areas. But I want you to hear me say this. This one is not a struggle for me. And it's not because I'm a preacher. And it's not because I'm a great guy. It's because it was modeled to me by my parents. From the time I was very young, I remember that we always spent more on people at Christmas than we consumed ourselves. From the time I was young, I always thought we were kind of just middle class, lower middle class people. Little did I know that my dad had a really good job. But we lived below our means and my parents constantly made it clear that the reason we were living below our means was to give back to God. I didn't know what the numbers looked like until I was about 15 years old. I got interested in cars and my dad and I were standing outside of a valet. We had moved, um, my dad was working on the space shuttle down in, uh, down in Houston and then IBM, which is who he actually worked for, moved him up to, uh, to Dallas to work for EDS and to do that account there. And uh, we had gone out to eat, and my dad and I were standing there, and I'll never forget this encounter. A car pulled up in front of us. It was either a Lamborghini or a Ferrari or something like that. And I looked at my dad, and I said, Dad, how cool would it be to have a car like that? And my dad, I don't know why, I guess he just felt like it was time to go ahead and let me in on this because I was going to find out a lot more about this when I ultimately ended up applying for college and things. And my dad looked at me and he said, son, your mom and I could easily afford a payment on a car like that. We give way more than that back to God through the church every week. Now, I wasn't really up to date on the whole financing issues, but I knew that was a lot of money. And I was so confused by it because I thought to myself, wait, 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 wait. We're giving that kind of money? Why? I mean, what's it for? And, and I began to think about it. It just kind of stayed in my brain. And I've watched my dad and my mom and, 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 and to see how they've, they've kind of focused their lives around not being consumers, but actually being conduit, actually blessing people, squandering it for the kingdom. And I've watched them do this, and it's been so very important to me. It's so very important for me and my wife. We don't don't argue about this. We don't argue about generosity. We don't have even disagreements about it. As a matter of fact, oftentimes my wife and I find ourselves trying to outdo each other on it. Because we were taught it. We saw it modeled. Now I'm going to prove it to you. My dad retired at 58 or 59. Did well enough to be able to do so. At 62, after we had started Sea Life, my dad had moved over to this particular area to be near his grandkids. 
And uh, my dad came on staff here for us at church. Y'all don't realize this, but you had a staff member that worked here for seven years who you did not pay. 40 hours a week. Not too long after um, he left here, I don't want to say terminated him. Uh, no, he did not. We did not. Um, he called my sister and I and our spouses to the house, and he and my mom explained to us that uh, this money, that they live long below their means, and so I felt pretty good about that because you know what that means. He's going to have a lot of money left. He's going to save more. And he explained to us uh, that they had decided to take a big portion of everything that they would leave in their death and leave it the way that they had modeled it in their life and that my sister and I will get to give their money away but not consume it. Huge portion of it. That's what my parents decided. Squander their wealth. I don't say that to you to get you impressed with my dad. That's not what I'm trying to do with my mom and dad. I'm not, I'm not trying to do that. What I'm trying to explain to you is this, is I look at my parents today, and, I, and I'm telling you, I, I look at my parents, and, and I, don't have, I, I don't have the words to describe how blessed I feel like they are. And it isn't because they consumed a lot. It isn't because their life has been charmed. It isn't because they don't have any health issues. It's, I honestly believe, because they have been generous. What will be said about you when you're gone? Come back. Let us teach you about it next week. You're dismissed.